Hello everybody, welcome back to Forza Horizon 5 with another showdown. I know it's been only two episodes since the last showdown, however, there were a lot of new sedans and estates and coupes and whatnot added to Horizon 5 in a very short period of time. So I'm practically obligated to compare them, see which one is best for your consumer advice in this fictional video game. Well, real video game fictional world, I guess, would be the proper terminology. Either way, we have a lot of sports sedans, and I am making a caveat here. A few of the cars here are coupes, like the RS5 and the M8. And there's also the Holden Malou. But critically, they are all based on platforms that are shared with sedans. So that would be the RS5 Sportback, the Holden HSV, and the M8 Grand Coupe. So they are technically coupes in that regard, but they can be eligible for this competition. Plus, I just want a bit of variety. I quite like these new cars, and they are new, which is, you know, always good. There is going to be a wild card, shall we say. That would be the Jaguar XKRS GT. And I chose this because sports sedans well, are often touted for supercar-level killers. Now, I know the XKRS GT isn't a supercar, but it is a track car. It's a sports car tuned up to 11, basically. And while well, sure it won't be scoring any points in this showdown, any sedan that beats it will get an additional 5 points. It won't lose anything, but if they don't beat it, they won't gain anything either. So there's definitely that advantage. I try to keep the class limits relatively similar, so all of these are A-class except for the Taycan Turbo S, which is S1 class, but it's very low S1 class. I try to keep it relatively consistent. You don't want one car running off in the distance while you have another car 20 seconds off the pace. It's just not very interesting that way. So with that out of the way, let's start with the lap times. Now in the RS4 Avant, we're running both of them, so I've got the RS4 and the RS6. Interestingly, they're only one PI apart, but they are very different philosophies. The RS6 is very powerful, over 550 horsepower. I did want a big, powerful Audi after all, but it is heavy and it's a bit old. The RS4, though, only 440-something horsepower, but it is pretty much brand new. I think it is the current generation, if not previous. Either way, 2018 the newest Audi RS4 that we have in the game, and it's really good handling. It doesn't have a lot of power. Certainly the power weight ratio is one of the more poorer ones, shall we say, but it is so nice to drive. The handling is superb. It really handles its weight quite well. We used to say that about the RS6, but the RS4 brings it to a whole new level, and, and in this field of relatively new machinery, you can start to see some vehicles that were dominant in previous Forza games are really starting to show their age. And the RS4, despite being mid-A class, actually is a nice car to drive. Gets the usual Audi understeer, but it's much easier to manage that understeer than, say, the RS7 or the RS6. And yeah, I just I just like seeing more estate cars in this game. We didn't get the estate car with the E63, but we got the estate car with the RS4. And the fact that it handles quite nicely is just another boost. Now, the best of the rest, i.e. the non-German vehicles, because Germans make up over 50% of this list, I would argue is probably the Cadillac. I know it's not going to be the fastest in terms of lap times. However, given the stigma of certainly the CTSV and the Americans um, not handling very well, I quite like it. It's it's not quite as much of a point and squirt muscle car as, say, the Hellcat that's also running, but it certainly has the power. 640 horsepower rear wheel drive. It's a weapon. It is still a little bit unsophisticated. There is still some muscle car influence there. The front end needs to get turned in a lot better in order to rival its German, well, rivals. But it is better than I was expecting, and its lap time does reflect that. We'll get to those in just a second. Power isn't a problem. Acceleration is good, not as good. I think that's a bit of a mixture of the all-wheel drive and just the relative heaviness. There are 
some lighter all-wheel drive vehicles in this field. All in all, the Cadillac did not do too shabby. Speaking of not too shabby, our, um, our bonus car, the XKRS, the wild car, meant to see if any vehicle could beat it. Turns out that was a very difficult benchmark. I figured this would be the best challenge that we would get out of this. I mean, this would be most suited to it, given that it is a track car on a track. And I, again, I try to pick relatively balanced tracks. I have a good mixture of high-speed corners, low-speed corners, some straightaways, just to try and get the whole picture. I figured this would be the best uh, challenge for the XKRS, and it was. It was very fast. So much faster than everything else on the entire grid, short of one car. Um, not what I had in mind when I set out the five bonus points for beating the XKRS when no car could beat it. But it's a bloody good handling car. It is a fantastic... I love how it drives. It's... It's not the best track car, but in this field, on a circuit, it's pretty darn near unstoppable. I say near because one car did beat it. And it is the highest PI car here, the Porsche Taycan Turbo S. A vehicle that I really don't like to drive all that much, because it's very heavy, it's one of the heaviest vehicles, if not the heaviest vehicle here. And it is the most powerful by an enormous margin. And it is insanely fast accelerating, but very fast accelerating and a lot of weight, and less aero than some of the other vehicles that we will see. It's not a good combination. It's better driving than some things, like, say, a Tesla or one of the electric SUVs, but it's nowhere near my favorite handling car. That doesn't matter, though, when it has so much acceleration and still pretty good handling once you get used to the brakes and the stopping distances and everything and the less corner speed than some other vehicles. Once you get used to all that, you can drive it sensibly and, and it just goes it is an incredibly fast car and yeah it destroyed everybody winning the lap time shootout with a 52.8 the second place jack was a 53.1 followed up by the m8 competition 53.4 yeah it was a whole six tenths of a second faster than the next sedan. I, I don't understand how it got such a quick lap. I, mean, I do, because it's so fast accelerating, but I still struggle to wrap my head around that that vehicle, which I really don't like to drive, is the fastest. Then followed up by the two Mercedes side-by-side, -side, the A63 just beating the AMG GT4 door. 53.4 and a 53.5, very close to the other two, a pattern that we will be seeing for the rest of the video. We got the Urus following up the Panamera in 7th and 6th respectively. The Urus doing quite well, managing its weight very well actually. I was surprised just how good handling this vehicle was. I was not expecting it to be so good to drive, and yet it was. Which is a bit scary, because it beat the Cadillac, 54.1, and it beat it considerably by three tenths of a second yeah but the cadillac did beat the audis of the rs4 rs5 and rs6 which both finished which all three of them finished right next to each other i guess they are very consistent even if it's not for very high positions and they got a few more cars rounding out the bottom with the jag and the blue and then the poor the poor hellcat did not have a good time it's a point of squirt muscle car in every sense of the word and it is it's not fun. It was considerably off the Malou, and the Malou was considerably off the Jag, and the Jag was considerably off everything else. Our next challenge is another handling-focused one. I try and keep things sort of half and half for the... I have four challenges each time. So the first one is always lap time, focusing on handling, a little bit of a balance. The second one is a pure handling one. And then we have some acceleration or a variety of tests or top speed later on. This is a speed zone, very much a handling focused challenge. And this is a nasty speed zone at that. It's very high speed with a lot of long high speed corners. So yes, the powerful cars will have an advantage because there are more straights to this speed zone. But they also might struggle because, well, chances are those more powerful vehicles are going to be all-wheel drive. And, well, uh, as we saw with the lap times, certain vehicles definitely struggle 
with Undersea. You saw the Malu there, that's Rumor Drive, just struggling in general. But this RS5, very underwhelming for a 2018 car. It's a coupe, so it should be better. It's not. I know it's not the most powerful thing, 440 horsepower, but all-wheel drive, it just did not have the power-weight ratio, did not have the sheer handling. The all-wheel drive understeer known by Audi was not giving it any favors either. The Cadillac, once again, following a similar pattern, just struggling to get that front end turned. Much better acceleration than all of the other rear-wheel drive cars but it just can't get that front end turned in. And speaking of rear-wheel drive cars, we got the Jaguar XKR, once again a solid showing, probably more favorable than the lap time, actually, in terms of uh, suitability, just because it is so high speed and it has those aerodynamic aids. Really good help there, and I loved how it drove in the lap time, so I really liked how it drove here as well. But the big change was the M5. The M5 really struggled in its lap time. I don't know if I just didn't get the most out of it or what, but I stand by all those lap times and it really struggled. And here though, it was fantastic. I loved how the M5, it really punched above its way. I guess I just got a perfect run with it. I don't know, but it really stepped itself up. Far better than the rest of its German rivals. In fact, only two vehicles actually beat the M5 first. No real surprise, the uh, Taycan Turbo S, all-wheel drive, electric power, and at the end of the day, still a Porsche, even if I don't like how it handles, it is brutally fast, and it can carry enough corner speed to negate any understeer, or in this case, slightly oversteer, just because of the sheer power uh, characteristics. So it was blindingly fast, and yet, it could not beat our winner, the Lamborghini Urus. No, you're not be mistaken. I don't understand this, but it was so nice to drive. It was the nicest car to drive by a mile. It's weird. I don't understand why this was so good, and yet it was. It turned in. It got traction. There was no understeer. It was perfectly set up. I even checked my tune to make sure that it was a stock car because I took it out of my garage. Wanted to make sure it didn't have racing slicks on or something. But no, it really was just that good. And so, the SUV... I can't, I can't believe I'm saying this. The SUV won the speed zone challenge by three hundredths of a mile an hour over the Taycan Turbo S with the M5 in third. I'm telling you, it really stepped up to the plate, beating out the AMG four-door and the M8 Competition Coupe, which went a second and a half faster around the circuit than the M5. I, like I said, I don't know if I just got a perfect run with it or the M5 did not mesh well with that circuit, but it... It, it really stepped it up relative to its previous challenge. Then we have the fastest rear wheel drive car, the Jag, no real surprises there, beating out the Porsche Panamera Turbo quite considerably relative to its all wheel drive stature, and the E63S for that matter. I mean, the, e, the E63 and the Jag are actually the exact same PI, and yet the Jag was almost a whole mile an hour faster despite being rear wheel drive. So, well done there. And then we have, once again, the Audi Brigade in 9th, 10th, and 11th. I told you it will be a common theme to see similar makes right next to each other. I mean, if all your vehicles are the same, do you really need to build multiple versions of them? I don't know. We have the usual stragglers of the Jag, which did better last time. It was... Ironically, a similar ranking, except for the Cadillac. Much worse. The Cadillac was in the top 10, and now it's barely 12th. Just beating out the Jag, which was a whole hundredth of a mile an hour away from 90 miles an hour, but it was sub-90 miles per hour. Apart from the Urus winning, it is as I expected, more or less. I expected the Audis to be a little bit better, and I expected the Cadillac to be a little bit better, but otherwise... This is pretty much how I pictured it, except for that bloody Urus. That was very good. Scary good, actually. 
Now, what is a super saloon advertisement if it does not talk about how fast it is? Even though a lot of these cars have electronic limiters in real life to 155 miles an hour. Everybody loves to brag about just how fast their sedan is, even if it's not really relevant, because these cars are insanely fast for a four-door. So I set out for a top speed run. And, yeah, they were mega fast. I mean, the usual suspects were quite good. The Mercedes with its 600 plus horsepower, same thing with the BMWs, they were incredibly good helped out by the downhill section no doubt but at the end of the day if you have over 600 horsepower chances are you're going to be pretty quick unless you're a porsche because while the panamera has proper gearing to match its 550 plus horsepower the Taycan turbo s does not it's electric which means it's the slowest vehicle I've ever driven, obviously hyperbole, but in this field it was pathetic. We'll cover exactly how fast it was in a little bit. But then we move to the obvious suspects for success. Finally, the Charger can do something good! Yes, the Charger is actually suited for the 707 horsepower. Of course, it is going to run away from pretty much everybody. It was a fantastic car. It didn't win, which is surprising to me. I, I thought for sure this would be the winner. It did very well, but it did not win. Although even the actual winner is not the winner in my heart because that honor goes to the Jaguar XFRS, a vehicle that has scored two 13th place finishes and has been solidly mediocre at best with just 550 horsepower i expected this vehicle to suck i expected it to be along the lines of the holden malu and the audi rs4 in terms of top speed it did a lot better than that the miracle workers at jaguar managed to push the xfrs to 210 miles an hour it was faster than the RS6. It was nearly as fast as the M5. I was so proud of the Jaguar. It's one of the least powerful cars here after the RS4 and RS5. And yet it did really freaking good. It beat all of the Audis by, in terms of top speed, a considerable margin. It did the 210 miles an hour top speed will put it into 7th place. Beating out the RS6, which is 208, which was the best of the Audis. It was just 2 miles an hour off the pace of both the Panamera and the M5, which tied. But the Panamera got a better lap time, so it gets the W. And then we have AMG. AMG did very well. 4th place for the E63, nothing to slouch about. But... The AMG GT four-door stepping it up 222 miles an hour, nearly approaching hypercar speed that is faster than a Porsche 918. I don't understand why it's so fast. I think the AMG and the E63S both have the same engine with similar power figures, and yet it's 9 miles an hour faster which once you hit that exponential curve that is top speed, nine miles an hour is insanely fast. I knew it would probably be the AMGs that did quite well if not win, but I thought it would be close between the Hellcat and the AMG, and the AMG destroyed the Hellcat by six miles an hour. I mean, it still got second. It was its best result so far, but yeah, I'm surprised by how fast the AMG GT four-door was. And I didn't see its result getting any worse because this is the half mile drive, our final challenge. This will obviously suit the all-wheel drive vehicles. It's just a fact. Each vehicle is given a five second delay because Forts is weird and doesn't launch the cars at ideal revs. So you have to rev it up manually in order to get the best launch. So it just has a five second margin there to get the revs right for each vehicle. Yeah, all-wheel drive, especially electric cars, were going to be dominant in this. And yeah, rear-wheel drive struggle. The best rear-wheel drive was going to be 
probably the Hellcat, just simply based on power. Once you do get the power down in the quarter mile, the rest of the run will be 707 horsepower careering you down the road. And you know what? The Charger did beat a few all-wheel drive cars. Surprises for who those cars were. Audi. The RS6 did quite well. I quite liked how the RS6 launched, despite being a pretty old car, relatively heavy, it really punched above its way. I know it has 550 horsepower, so of course it should beat the RS4 Avant, but I don't know. Maybe the RS4 has better launch control or some better tires, lighter weight. No, it didn't matter because 400 something horsepower simply was not enough for the RS4, and it really struggled, even getting beaten by the Charger Hellcat rear-wheel drive car. Not great. Again, no points for guessing which vehicles came out on top. The all-wheel drive German cars of the AMG GT four-door in third, followed up by the E63S in second, and the winner by an enormous margin the Taycan Turbo, it's obvious, okay, it's obvious. It's all-wheel drive, it's electric, instant torque, insane power. Yeah, it demolished everything by an easy second. The Taycan did a 13.9. The next best car did a 15 dead. Amazingly, the E63 and the GT four-door got identical times down to the thousandths of a second. So again, a tiebreaker is decided by the lap time. Same question about the Audis, if they're so similar, why build them? Why have different models? I don't know. But, yeah. All-wheel drive locked out the top seven places. It's essential. Then it was followed up by the Charge Hellcat, the fastest of the rear-wheel drive cars, beating out the Urus by a fraction, just just five hundredths of a second, basically. And then followed up by the CTSV and the poor, poor underpowered cars, the Audi, the Jag, and the Malou. And that brings us to our winner, the Mercedes-AMG GT four-door, by a healthy margin, 274 points, based on the V8 supercar scoring system. Just consistency ended up giving it the win top five across the board with a win at the top speed and a podium finish in the half mile it was pretty safe from second place the porsche taycan the porsche actually won more events winning both the lap time and the half mile with a second place in the speed zone but it's pathetic 172 mile an hour top speed really destroyed any hopes of winning if it just had if I was just allowed to tune the gearbox, it would have won this challenge. But no, if it had just scored 200 miles an hour, it would have been in the top 10. It would have gotten an extra 10 points, and it would have won by a single point. But it didn't. It nearly got beaten by the M8, which I'm pretty sure was driven by George Russell because it was Mr. Consistency. With a third place, a fifth place, a third place, and a fourth place. And that kept it in the running for the win. Ultimately, it would have needed a win in order to actually push it over the edge. And honestly, with its weight and just lack of front-end grip relative to other vehicles, like, say, the XKRS, it wouldn't be able to do that. But a podium finish, despite never actually getting even a second place, is an impressive feat in amongst itself. Then we have the other AMG, the E63 in fourth. Rounding out the top five, we had the M5, which would have gone a podium position had it not just died in the lap time, because it was also very consistent up until that lap time. Third place, fifth place, fifth place, and twelfth. Bit of a letdown in that one. Again, I don't know if I just didn't get the speed out of it or... What? But it did not like that circuit. The SUV of the Lamborghini Urus would finish in 6th, saved solely by its incredible out-of-the-blue win at the speed zone, because it had some pretty mediocre finishes everywhere except for the speed zone, which it won. I still don't understand that, but it it took the victory. You saw, you, I even had the video of it beating the Taycan. 
I would understand that, but it did allow it to score a sixth position ahead of the Panamera, and then the RS6 coming in clutch with the eighth beating out, and then we have the rest of the Audis. They just, the Audi RS4 and RS5, they really need an extra 100 horsepower to compete in this field. I understand that's what the big dogs like the e-tron and the rs7 and the rs6 are for but until we get the 2020 rs6 which with my luck will be released as soon as this video is uploaded they won't really be able to challenge for the top positions their high pi is attributed solely to their fantastic handling but in this field of vehicles that are so good handling that 100 horsepower deficit, and in some cases 300 horsepower deficit when we're talking about the Taycan, you can't overcome that. It's not possible to overcome such a big uh, a going of power. But they did beat the Jaguar, which despite an impressive showing in the top speed, was unable to crack the top 10. The best that the American could get is the Hellcat in 9th, saved solely by its top speed. Yeah, scored last in two events and yet it's not a finish a top 10 because it has an incredible top speed and a half decent half mile. The Germans just are unstoppable. They locked out the top five positions and they would have locked out the top 10 probably if not for the Hellcat and the Urus. And a lot of them, to their credit, beat the Jag. None of them except the Ty can't beat it on a lap, but a lot of them beat it at the speed zone and even more of them beat it in the half mile and the top speed. So these vehicles definitely lived up to their sports car, supercar killing reputations. But that will be it for this episode of Forza Horizon 5. We'll be back with more.